Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. A warm but cool day. A warm, loving welcome to you all. Moreover, God welcomes you into his presence, and we are thankful and blessed by his spiritual presence in this place as well. So, um, good morning. I hope you're all having a good day, and we can rejoice in the Lord here. Uh, believe it or not, um, September is pretty much uh, on its way out. This is the last Sunday in September. And as we move into October, I am reminded by a passage that is, every year we have calendars for sale. I think it's probably starting in November, December, something like that. And today's passage in um, the, for, for today, is uh, in Thessalonians, and I'm going to paraphrase it, and it uh, talks about, um, um, among other things, it talks about the people that work for us, that work for God. And so, paraphrasing, uh, first the uh, Thessalonians chapter 5, verses 12 through 18, we are told to respect those who work hard among us. Hold them in the highest regard in love because of their works. Live in peace with each other. Warn those who are idle, help the weak, and be patient with everyone. Always try to be kind with each other, and always um, be kind to other people as well. So within this congregation, we want to be kind, certainly, and loving to each other, but we want to extend that outside of the walls of this church and into the community and the people that we meet. Be joyful always, pray continually, give thanks in all circumstances for this is God's will for us in Christ Jesus. And uh, when it talks about people who work hard among us, I just want to remind people that October, uh, the month of October is Pastor Appreciation Month. So uh, a little pat on the back uh, for Pastor Allen uh, as we move into October and appreciate all the work that he does, but not only the work that he does, the work that we do among ourselves to make this happen. So let us pray. Dear Lord, we want to be able to do what is told in your word, to work hard for you, so many times we fall very short in doing this, and we ask you for your forgiveness when this happens. We thank you for your mercy, your grace, and your love. Be with us here, hold us close, and protect us. We give you all honor and glory. It is in Jesus, our Savior, that we pray all these things. Amen. Uh, as far as announcements, um, if you look at your bulletin, then um, we were going to today have a little, not camp out, but a fire, uh, a greeting around the fire over at the parsonage because the weather looks a little bit iffy and it's a little chilly and, and might get some rain. Um, at least at this point in time, we're going to postpone that until next Sunday. Hopefully we can get some Indian summer in here and we can enjoy that kind of little uh, fire around the, um, and, and warm each other up. Um, a Tuesday at 7 p.m., the Finance Committee will meet at the church. Wednesday um, is a prayer and Bible study at one o'clock. I also would like to uh, remind people, and I wanna thank Bill for helping out. Uh, we're doing drive through prayer on Wednesdays from four o'clock to six o'clock. Uh, Pastor Allen is there and Milt has been uh, uh, kind enough to help out. But uh, if we can get other people to work with that and maybe do like a rotational thing, that would, that would be great. Uh, looking ahead in October, uh, this is a little time away, a couple of weeks, there's a board meeting on the 11th of October WHFMS is meeting October 15th, and Christmas in October is October 23rd, but that's kind of looking at the month of October. Um, 
So I think that is pretty much it for announcements. Are there any other announcements that I missed that are important? If not, then we would ask you to join us as we open up it was uh, hymn number 446, Faith is the Victory. Let's stand together. Have you seen what the name of the next is? A hurricane? Did, did anybody see what it was? It's called Hermine, and, and I 
thought to myself, well, this is going to be an easy hurricane because it's going to come in nice and sweet and everyone's going to be, but very interesting. Are there anything that we could be praying for today? Art. Yeah, Art has shingles, so please, we're going to pray for Art. Um, Sheila had a procedure this week. We just want to pray for, um, you know, recovery there. What, anything else? Yeah, I'd like to sure. have us keep your family in prayer. I okay. know that uh, Kirsten and, and Wesley have, have moved along and they're in Maine. And it's, uh, I remember when my Amanda left the house to go to college and it was just very, very tearful and uh, an emotional time. So I would yep. ask that the congregation keep your family in prayer. Well, appreciate that. Thursday was not super easy watching the car drive away, to be honest with you, but... Uh, God is good, and we're happy for them. But anyway, thank you. Appreciate that. Anything else we can pray for? Okay. Pray for my nephew. Yeah. He's got COVID. Let's go to prayer then. God, we just want to come before you right now. Ask your blessing to be upon this time that we've gathered. I thank you for each person that is here, Lord. And I pray that you would speak to each one of our hearts, that you would teach us this morning, that we would know we've been with you. Father, we thank you for all the good things you do, do and are doing. We thank you for answered prayer that we've seen again and again, Lord. We thank you for the gift of prayer. Lord, we're thankful that, that we can call ourselves by your name. What a privilege that is to be called Christians. All because of what your son did for us on the cross. We thank you for that, God. We give you praise for that. <clears throat> Lord, you know we do have requests this morning that we want to bring before you. We, we, we want to lift up our today, God. Dealing with shingles. God, I pray that that you would begin to put your hand upon him and, and that would kind of run its course and be over soon, Lord. But just help him right now, Lord, deal with that pain. I pray that it would be quick and, and, and hopefully he's feeling better and get all the help that he needs medically and, and medicine-wise to help him with that, Lord. So we lift our before you today, God. Father, we also want to remember Sheila, Lord, as she had a procedure this week. I just pray that you continue to help her to heal from that and that soon she'd be... Uh, 100%, so we lift Sheila up to you. And Father, I want to lift up Pam, Lord. You know she's dealing with, with COVID, and I just pray, God, that you would help her right now, Lord. That you would, that whatever she needs, that you would give it to her and help her to feel better soon and, and, and be back to, to normal soon. So we lift up Pam, Lord. Thank you for her. Lord, she watches all the time, so we just want to lift her up in prayer, God. Lord, we thank you for, again, everything you've given to us. We think of uh, school back in session and we want to continue to lift up our teachers, Lord, and our students, Lord, as they're learning about you. I just pray for their protection, God. Um, we're, not, we're living in a difficult world, a difficult, sin-filled world. And sometimes our kids are going to see things and experience things that we wish they didn't. But I just pray, God, for your protection upon each of them. Pray for our teachers, Lord. We have a bunch of teachers in this church. And I know even that's hard, Lord. I just pray that you would help them to continue to, to keep uh, the goal in mind to teach young people. And help them, Lord, as they do that. Protect them, but just help them to do their very best for you, God, as they do that. We thank you, Lord, for this morning, for a chance to be with you. And I just pray that your Holy Spirit would be alive and at work in this place, in our lives. Thank you for who you are and for all you have done for us. And we pray all this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Scripture reading today is found in... James chapter 2, verses 14 through 26. 
What good is it, my brothers, if a man claims to have faith but has no deeds? Can such faith save him? Suppose a brother or sister is without food, clothes, or, and daily food. If one of you says to him, Go, I wish you well, keep warm and well fed, but does nothing about his physical need, what good is it? In the same way, faith by itself, if it is not accompanied by action, is dead. But someone will say, You have faith, I have deeds. Show me your faith without deeds, and I will show you my faith by what I do. You believe that there is one God? Good. Even the demons believe that and shudder. You foolish man, do you, do you want evidence that faith without deeds is useless? Was not our ancestor Abraham considered righteous for what he did when he offered his son Isaac on the altar? You see that his faith and his actions were working together. And his faith was made complete by what he did. And the scripture was fulfilled that said, Abraham believed God, and it was credited to him as righteousness. And he was called God's friend. You see that a person is justified by what he does, and not by faith alone. In the same way, was not even Rahab, the prostitute, considered righteous for what she did when she gave lodging to the spies and sent them off in a different direction. As the body without spirit is dead, so faith without deed is dead. The reading of God's Word. Today is September 25th, which means what's happening in three months from today? Christmas. Christmas. And I say that to say one of the favorite parts, and I think some of you too, is our Christmas Eve service. And probably the highlight is at the end, we have the, you know, we'll have the, the um, uh, Advent wreath, and in the middle is the Jesus candle. And we take, I take my candle from the Jesus candle, and then go around to you and to see each light light up. And it's, it's uh, representative coming from Jesus. Jesus is the light of the world, and he's given us that light. So that we can share with others. We want to sing about that right now. And I, and I know, so please stand. And I know you know the song. We're going to sing this together and hopefully have fun as we worship this little light of mine. Let's sing it together. Let it shine, let it shine, let it shine. 
Sim. We continue on our series in James. We want to look at this idea of save people through God's work. Let's pray. Father, we pause right now to come before you and ask, Lord, that you, through your spirit, would teach us right now. Help us to hear these words of James and to take them into our hearts and to understand them, God. Teach us, Lord. Challenge us this morning. We give this time to you right now. And I pray this in Jesus' name. But most of us probably know who Ale Alexander Graham Bell was, though probably less and less these days. But he was an amazing, amazingly talented person. He invented the autometer, which uses, is used to test your hearing. He invented the tricycle landing gear that you find on airplanes. He made some improvements on the telegraph and the phonograph and a bunch of other well-known machines. In addition, to all that, he was the co-founder of the prestigious magazine Science. He served as president of the National Geographic Society, and he spent his life working with deaf people. His, his mother and one and his wife were deaf, I believe. But probably his most famous creation was a telephone. And it also made his family and descendants hugely wealthy. But he almost lost it all. You see, Bell never seemed to get around to submitting a patent application for the telephone. Finally, his father-in-law, who had financed a lot of his research, got so impatient with Bell that he filed a patent on Bell's behalf. And the date was Valentine's Day, 1876, Bell's 29th birthday. I'm assuming he's younger there than 29, but anyway. And it was a good thing he did because just a few hours later, Another scientist by the name of Elisha Gray went to the patent office to get a patent on a machine he'd been working on for many years. Guess what it was? Telephone. The story reminds us, I think, that sometimes it's not enough simply to have great ideas. We need to act on them. Bell and his father-in-law are a good example of the relationship between faith and works. Bell had faith in his telephone, but did nothing about it. His father-in-law had faith and works to go with it. So the passage we look at this morning is probably one of the better known in the book of James. James is very concerned with walking the walk, or walking the talk of our faith, and not just talking about it. And I think it begins with this truth. What we believe determines how we act. It's not what we say we believe, but what we actually believe that controls our behavior. For example, I may say I believe that exercise is good for me, and I actually do believe that, but since I sometimes don't always follow through on what I say I believe, I must be acting on another stronger belief. One that I may not even want to acknowledge. But there's only one reason that belief isn't followed by action. And that is that a stronger, another belief is getting in the way. But I don't want to get ahead of myself. Here's the key thought this morning from James. We are not saved by works. We're not. But saved people do God's work. Now you're going to find in this passage that Skip read for us, that faith is used 11 different times in the passage. And it's used in at least three different ways that I want to look at together this morning. And it begins with this one. A surfacy face. Faith. Now, I may be making up a word here, but you get the picture. It seems to be that, it seems to be a faith that's only on the surface. So let's look at verses 14 and 17 through 17. He said, what good is it, my brothers, if a man claims to have faith, but has no deeds. Can such faith save him? Suppose a brother or sister was without clothes and daily food. If one of you says to him, go, I wish you well, keep warm and fed, but does nothing about his physical needs, what good is it? In the same way, faith by itself, 
if it's not accompanied by action, is dead. So James begins with two questions here in verse 14. First of all, what good is it, my brothers, if a man claims to have faith but has no T's? And the second question, can such faith save him? Now James is basically saying this, which is his main premise in this passage. What is the use of saying that you have faith if it doesn't show up in what you do? And further, can that kind of faith save? Now he's asking a very tough question here. But again, notice the use of the word brothers. There's a tender tone to his question because he cares about those he's writing this to. He does not want them to have a faith that has no use or is worthless. And then he then shares a very vivid illustration in verses 15 and 16. He says, suppose a brother or sister is without clothes and daily food. If one of you says to him, go, I wish you well, keep warm and well fed, but does nothing about his physical needs, what good is it? Notice that he, he calls this person in this story a brother or sister. So he, he is using the proposed example of a fellow believer here. This fellow believer is poorly clothed and has no food. And then James then makes it personal by saying, and suppose one of you says to him. Now many translations use the phrase, go in peace here, which was a common Jewish greeting. But the word go can mean go away or even get out of my sight. So go, I wish you well, keep warm and well fed. And then here's the key, but does nothing about his physical needs. James then asked, what good is it? And he uses that phrase two times in the first few verses. This is to show that this surfacey faith is useless. See, functional belief is what James calls true faith. That is a belief that is strong enough to influence our behavior. We should not talk if we're not willing to walk it, he's thinking, saying. Workless faith is worthless faith. We see something very similar from John in 1 John 3, where he says, If anyone has material possessions and sees his brother in need but has no pity on him, how can the love of God be in him? Dear children, let us not love with words or tongue, but with actions and in truth. See, the wish for this brother or sister to be warm and filled with food is not only empty, but it reveals a dead faith. And don't you think if this brother or sister had the ability and the resources that they would be well fed and, and, and warm? He says in the same way, faith by itself, if it's not accompanied by action, is dead. Simply a faith that does not lead to action is lifeless. The word used for dead here is necros in the Greek, which means a dead person or a corpse. Now, as we read this, it would seem that James and Paul are at odds with each other, or kind of contradict each other. Because Paul clearly teaches that we are saved by grace through faith, apart from works. And James seems to be saying we must have faith plus work in order to be saved. Martin Luther, who was a huge proponent of justification by faith alone, struggled and stumbled over the book of James. At one point, he actually called it an epistle of straw. He once said that he would give his doctor's beret to anyone who could reconcile James and Paul. Now, I would never put myself anywhere near the level of Martin Luther, but I do actually think there is a simple way to reconcile what appears to be an apparent contradiction. But understand, this is not a small thing, because it's dealing with how one is made right before a holy God. Are we justified by faith alone, or are we justified by faith plus our works? That's the question. And I appreciate a pastor, Stephen Cole's insights here. First of all, he reminds us that the Holy Spirit does not contradict himself in Scripture. And since we believe that all scriptures are inspired in an error, as we read in 2 Timothy 3, verse 16, where it tells us all scripture is God-breathed 
and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness. So then Paul and James are not at odds. We teach both because the Bible teaches both. But then Pastor Cole reminds us to understand the, the particular problem that each human author is addressing. Paul wrote the book of Galatians to deal with the era of adding outward work to faith alone for salvation. But James is writing this book to confront those who claim to believe in Christ, but did not have any fruit to show for it. You see, we can find in both Paul and James the importance of both faith and works. Instead of, being, instead of contradicting each other, they really are complementing each other. Paul stresses the root of salvation, while James emphasizes the fruit after salvation. We could say that Paul explains how one gains entrance into salvation, while James examines how one gives evidence of it. A man named Griffith Thomas, who was a pastor and theologian from the 19th century, explained it this way. He said, they are not soldiers of different armies fighting against each other but soldiers of the same army fighting back against enemies coming from opposite directions. Salvation is by grace alone through faith in Jesus Christ alone. James is not in any way trying to teach against that. But he would add that good works prove our faith is genuine. Paul emphasized the priority of faith while James focuses on the proof of faith. We are not saved by works, but saved people do God's work. Listen to what Paul himself wrote in 1 Thessalonians 1, 2 and 3. He says, we always thank God for all of you, mentioning you in our prayers. We continually remember before our God and Father, listen, your work produced by faith, your labor prompted by love, and your endurance inspired by hope in our Lord Jesus Christ. Faith must always demonstrate itself in action. Again, we don't work in order to be saved. We work because we are saved. We're not justified by faith plus works, but a faith that works. True faith will lead to new fruit. Paul in Ephesians 2 makes it very clear that we're not saved by works. He says this, For it is by grace you have been saved through faith. And this, not from yourself, it is the gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. Boom. Now, let's go on and read verse 10 of the same passage. He goes on. For we are God's workmanship, created in Christ to do good works, which God has prepared in advance for us to do. We're not saved by our works, but rather by a faith that works. We're justified by faith alone, but not by a faith that is alone. See, I want to be very clear here. We don't somehow add actions to our faith in order to be saved, but saving faith will express itself in action. And then we move on to the next thing, a syrupy faith. Look at verses 18 and 19. But someone will say, you have faith, I have deeds. Show me your faith without deeds, and I will show you my faith by what I do. You believe there is one God. Good, even the demons believe that and shut up. So he goes on in these verses by saying that a syrupy faith can actually be demonic. Doesn't sound right, does it? But someone will say, you have faith, I have deeds. Show me your faith without deeds, and I will show you my faith by what I do. James wants to shake up complacent believers whose behavior doesn't reflect a dynamic faith. So he writes this verse 19. You believe there is one God. Good. Even the demons believe that, and they shudder. He's, he's quoting part of the Shema here from Deuteronomy 6, verses 4 and 5. O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength. It's easy to say words of Scripture, but it's works that show we believe the scripture to be true. To re recite the, the, the Shema can be a good idea, but to stop there is not enough. Are you aware that the demons are orthodox in their doctrine? 
Not one of them is an atheist or an agnostic. They all know that God exists. That Jesus is the Savior and the Holy Spirit seals every believer. They know these things. And they even shudder, James tells us. The word was used to, the shudder was used to signify having goosebumps and, and literally means to quake with fear and to bristle up. Emotionally, the demons know the truth. And it scares them, probably as it should. Listen, the, the acceptance of a creed doesn't mean you're converted. Your doctrine can be 100% correct while you're still living in darkness. The man with a, a surfacy faith is only engaged intellectually, while those with a surfy kind of faith are, are simply engaged emotionally. Maybe you've settled it in your head and in your heart, but if faith is not lived out through your hands, your faith is not saving faith. Listen, both of these kinds of faith are important. Please understand that. The problem is when someone keeps just one of them alone. Do we need to intellectually believe what we read in Scripture? Yes, absolutely. But it can't end there. Do we need to emotionally accept it as truth in our hearts? Yes. But as we're going to see, there's one more step, and that is saving faith. Through verses 20 to 26. You foolish man, do you want evidence that faith without deeds is useless? Was not our ancestor Abraham considered righteous for what he did when he offered his son Isaac on the altar? You see that his faith and his actions were working together, and his faith was made complete by what he did. And the scripture was fulfilled that says, Abraham believed God and was credited to him as righteousness, and he was called God's friend. You see that a person is justified by what he does and not by faith alone. In the same way, was not even Rahab the prostitute considered righteous for what she did when she gave lodging to the spies and sent them off in a different direction. As the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without deeds is dead. See, a saving faith engages the head, the heart, and the hands. A surfacy or a surfy faith is words without works and emotions without action. Look at verse 20. It says, you foolish man, do you want evidence that faith without deeds is useless? A foolish person is one who is empty or is hollow. And the word useless means lazy or idle. If we think saving faith can exist with no fruit, he's saying, then we are fools. And then after asking his rhetorical question here in verse 20, James asks two more questions to get us to consider two Old Testament examples of saving faith. And each of these individuals uh, exhibited a faith that affects the head, the heart, and their hands. And while coming from different backgrounds and experiences, both of them demonstrated their faith by their actions. Take a close look at these two. We have Abraham and Rahab, a man and a woman, a Jew and a Gentile, father of the Jews, a foreigner, reputable, disreputable, Moral, immoral, a revered patriarch, and a redeemed prostitute. But here's the important part. They both had saving faith with fruit. So let's look at Abraham. Verses 21 23. Was not our, our ancestor Abraham considered righteous for what he did when he offered his son Isaac on the altar? You see that his faith and his actions were working together. And it was, his faith was made complete by what he did. And the scripture was fulfilled that said, Abraham believed God, and it was credited to him as righteousness. And he was called, called God's friend. It says, it was credited to him as righteousness. Now, obviously, credited is a financial term, and it means to, to put into one's account. When he believed, God put righteousness into his account. But when Abraham lived out his faith, it completed his faith which means it was brought to maturity. Abraham was not saved by offering his son, but his obedience proved his previous saving faith. He was not saved by faith plus works, but by a faith that works. In verse 22, James kind of reiterates his premise. He says, 
you see that a person is justified by what he does and not by faith alone. So how do we know that Abraham had faith? Well, we, we have the whole Bible, so we read in Hebrews 11. By faith, Abraham, when God tested, it, tested him, offered Isaac as a sacrifice. He's also called a friend of God in James. Jesus in John 15, 14 said, You are my friend if you do what I command. Abraham's actions proved that his faith was alive. Now look at verse 25. In the same way, was not even Rahab the prostitute considered righteous for what she did when she gave lodging to the spies and sent them off in a different direction? Rahab ran a house brothel, but hid the two Hebrew spies and gave them an escape route. And there's no way she would have done that had she not first put her faith in God. She gave a clear statement to that truth in Joshua 2, verse 11, where she said, For the Lord your God is God in heaven above and on the earth below. You see, Rahab didn't just say she believed. <coughs> her, her, her behavior gave evidence of her belief. Very clearly stated, he was loving. By faith, the prostitute Rahab, because she loved and spied, was not killed with those who were disobedient. Her faith worked. She not only responded with her mind and her emotions, she engaged her will through her works, what she did. God, God honored her faith and put her in the family tree of Jesus. Abraham was saved by faith, and he proved his faith by offering his son in, in obedience to God. Rahab was saved by faith and proved her faith by protecting those spies from God's people. We are saved by faith, but we're also called, I believe, to prove that faith. This is something that I believe should happen kind of automatically. If we really believe that God sent his son to die for us, and then we accept that son, Jesus, as our Savior in our hearts, listen, we are going to want to work for him as we realize all he's done for us. Our hearts are changed, and we see things as he does. And hopefully respond accordingly. This is true for a respected patriarch. It's true for a redeemed prostitute. And it's true for everyone. No matter how great your sins are. How great you think they are. The Bible says in Romans 10 verse 13. Everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Now in verse 26 James uses a brief illustration again. With a strong summary statement, he said, As the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without deeds is dead. You know, if you see a body that's not breathing, you can conclude that it's dead. In the same way, if you see faith that does not produce good works, you can conclude it's a dead faith. See, faith is the root, and good works are the fruit of our faith. If there is no fruit, our faith is empty of life. If, if you have an apple tree with no apples on it, probably something wrong with that tree, isn't there? We're not saved by work. That's very true. But saved people are going to do God's work. We don't want to be a, a light kind of church which skates on the surface or just serves up syrupy sermons. But we do want to be the saved people of the Torrington Avenue Christian Church who are doing God's work. May that be said of each one of us. Let's pray. Thank you so much, Lord, for your word. We thank you once again for our brother James and the way that you have used him and are using him to teach. Holy Spirit, I pray that you would continue to work among us. Thank you, Lord, that we can come to you in faith through what Jesus did for us on the cross. And we're so incredibly thankful for all you did for us. But I pray, Lord, that you would help us, lead us, to begin to show fruit of what you've done in our lives. Please, Lord, may that be said of us that saved people do God's work. Thank you, Lord. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. I'm going to ask that you stand. And if you want to look along in your... 
Hymn, hymn number 435, My Faith Has Found a Resting Place. Let's stand and sing this together as we close. 435. opportunity to be with you in your house and Lord I ask I continue to ask that your spirit would continue to teach us remind us of what we've heard and Lord I pray that you would lead us to show that fruit of our faith thank you for the faith that we do have God and what went into making that possible thank you for sending your son Jesus to die for us and it's in his name I pray all these wonderful things Lord amen, amen.